It's, it's my privilege to uh, kick off the OSPOCON uh, track. Um, Hannah Jimenez is here. Anna is our uh, fearless leader on the OSPOCON uh, tracks, as well as just really getting all of us together from the OSPO perspective. I want to start off by saying um, the last four years have been anything but boring. Would you agree? It's been um, an incredible last four years. <laughs> Pandemic, and then big macroeconomic changes, and um, I don't think we are the same people that we were in 2018, 19. I know I'm not. I'm forever changed. Um, and OSPOs are forever changed too. We've evolved. We have to evolve. We can't be the same OSPO that we were in 2018 and 19. Uh, we are looking at the world differently. We have different challenges today. And uh, so hopefully you will get a chance to see some of the challenges that I see and some of the opportunities I see. I've, I've decided to focus on four of them. Um, and I welcome you all to add you know, new challenges that we should also consider. So my name is Nithya Ruff, and I run the open source program office at Amazon, not AWS. We, we support all of Amazon as a team. Uh, we support the AWS part, which a lot of you are familiar with, because that's what we serve developers and where developers work. Um, but we also support the stores, the devices, organizations like Fire TV and Alexa, et cetera, and Prime and music. So the entire um, spectrum of Amazon companies is what we support and very proud to support that. Okay, um, I want to start off with the history of OSPOs because I think it's important to kind of see where we came from and why OSPOs were created. To me, in the 1990s, I, I started working in open source in 1998 at Silicon Graphics. And so, to me, in the 1990s, uh, you had the early tech companies and tech providers like IBM and Sun and SGI and HP who started using open source and shipping open source based servers and products. And they used to have something called open source strategy offices, office or the Linux Development Center or Open Source Technology Group. So they weren't quite called OSPOs, but they did OSPO kind of stuff. They helped navigate open source across the company and teach people you know, how to work with open source and kind of acted as a liaison between company and culture, community rather, and community and company. And then in the 2000s, Building upon the fact that you had a lot of free x86 servers with Linux running around and huge amount of uh, compute capacity, you have companies uh, who are now called hyperscalers, Yahoo, Twitter, Google, Facebook, etc., start building humongous data centers at hyperscale uh, at, you know, and creating production level data centers to fuel their services. Um, they built it upon the shoulder of uh, a lot of open source. Um, so a lot of open source and infrastructure. So you start seeing them create something called the OSPO. And the OSPOs in those days um, were responsible for open sourcing some uh, really terrific software like Hadoop and uh, I, you know just a lot of Cassandra came out of these companies and GraphQL and uh, React Native from you know Facebook, etc. So there was a lot of uh, good work done uh, by these OSPOs. You see people like um, uh, you know uh, Simon Phipps uh, and Denise Cooper and Eileen Evans and others, uh, part of this vanguard of leaders in open source program offices in those days. Then in 2023, right now. Uh, you find that open source program offices are everywhere, in every vertical, uh, in public sector, in uh, universities. It's become the norm. Uh, it's become a well-established concept. And you have groups like the OSPO++ and To Do Group who uh, really take time to connect uh, all of these OSPO leaders together, help them grow and help them you know, become um, better OSPOs uh, as a whole, and they run um, teaching sessions, mentoring sessions, etc. So it's become a well-established concept now. 
So what is an OSPO? Um, I kept, keep talking about this four-letter acronym. Um, OSPO, I think most of us know it, but just to ground us, OSPO is designed to be the center of competency for an organization's open source operations and structure. But it really varies. Each OSPO does what their particular organization needs and should. Uh, it should really fit into the needs of that particular organization. An OSPO in a university is different than an OSPO in public sector is different than an OSPO for a company like Amazon is different than what it used to be when I was at Comcast, which was more of a digital transformation company uh, serving media and entertainment. And you find that uh, open source in academia is, is really growing, and, and Jacob can attest to and take a lot of pride in uh, the fact that Johns Hopkins and Carnegie Mellon and Cross, uh, which is center of research uh, in open source software at uh, UC Santa Cruz, which is now becoming a full-fledged OSPO for UC system in California, uh, this is incredible. And, and they're taking on, and RIT, they're taking on the mantle of open science, open data, and a university used to be, used to be kind of the IP and patent very rigid um, organizations from an innovation perspective, and now they're you know, looking at other ways to innovate and flourish. And you find in public sector also uh, cities like Paris, um, county, uh, country governments, uh, United Nations uh, organizations like the World Health Organization have OSPOs. And in fact, the European Union uh, recommends OSPOs as a new tool for governments. Am I getting this right? Good. Uh, and it is, it is becoming, um, I, I love this diagram because I think it's creating a common language for us to talk across these different constructs, across universities, public sector, uh, academia, foundations, companies, and you know who your OSPO uh, Connect is in these organizations, and they help you navigate that organization. They help you collaborate across these organizations, which I think um, is a beautiful language that we've created through a common way of looking at OSPOs. And when you look at the maturity model of OSPOs, which comes from uh, the Linux Foundation's deep dive into OSPOs, you find that all of us took this journey and sometimes we stop in various stages. Uh, I also find that various parts of our company are in various stages of this adoption. And so it's not always even, oh yeah, we climbed the steps and we are now leaders. Um, what I find is we all start with adoption. Sometimes uh, companies don't know that open source is coming in or are oblivious. Sometimes they're very conscious that open source is being consumed and they're consciously consuming it. Um, once you start understanding that open source is in your company, the next typical step tends to be uh, creating policies on how we use it, uh, how we consume it, you know, what licenses are okay to use, how we'll distribute it, how we will uh, release it. And so legal teams start getting involved. But you need um, a, an, an organization between the legal team, which is often you know, one or two people, and we don't have enough legal experts actually in open source. And then you have a, a huge pool of developers, right? So typically what ends up happening is uh, development organizations um, bottleneck into the legal team in early stages saying, hey, can I use this license? Can I do this? Can I do that? And legal is recreating policy again and again and again and answering the same question again and again. And one of the big reasons OSPOs come into existence is to act as this uh, development advocacy organization so that they can field questions from developers, understand developers' needs, how they're using it uh, in their uh, pro production and technology, and to then translate it into questions that need to go into legal or questions that need to go into public policy or into marketing or into business decisions. So open source program offices really act as a developer advocacy organizations to help developers uh, with policy, process, automation, so you know, playbooks, et cetera, and, and cultural transformation, as George and I were talking about. 
is really educating all of these other organizations in the company, um, purchasing, legal, et cetera, on how open source norms are and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And then you find, um, you know, inevitably when you use open source and you have access to source code, you want to modify it, you want to fix it, um, and then you want to upstream that fix or you want to contribute back into open source. And um, that's when engagement starts happening and developers are becoming part of the communities that they're contributing to, that they're using, that they're part of the upstream uh, work in. Um, and that creates a lot of um, new norms for the company. How should our developers participate in this community? Should we make time for them to do open source? And uh, which community should we invol be involved in? Um, and, and we struggle as companies to uh, justify the amount of time developers need to spend in working with upstream communities. Often the impact is not immediate and it's not you know, in terms of revenue or cost. And so we kind of say, I don't know why you know, so-and-so should have to spend so much time working in upstream when they can be working with customers or with revenue bearing uh, products and features and functions. So OSPOs get into the business of advocating again uh, with businesses to say, um, you know, you do need to invest in upstream. You do need to work with your dependent uh, upstream projects. You do need to invest in uh, developers working um, and spending time, you know, becoming a part of that community, building trust, fixing things, you know, chopping wood, lifting, uh, lifting, uh, bringing water, fetching water, etc. And the last stage, I would say, is, is typically leadership and, and some parts of our company are leaders, I think, because they are not only contributing back and engaging with their upstream communities, but they're releasing code and they're releasing you know, original work done in the company because they say, we want to make the world a better place and we want to put this back in the world so that others can benefit from you know, the work they're doing. And that is really the objective for a lot of us, I suppose, is to get there. Not just consume, <clears throat> but contribute, educate, make cultural change happen, uh, create the connection between community and the company or the organization, and really give back and, and really make the world a better place because we are here. So having said that, um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities uh, you know, that face us in 2023 and beyond? I want to start with the first one, which is developer experience. And the reason I start with this is because um, Diego and I are both part of a larger developer experience organization at Amazon. And for, for many, many years when I worked in an OSPO, I would think of OSPO as more risk mitigation and that we are all about risk and uh, you know, about education. But it occurred to me that we are also about making it productive and easy for developers to do their best work. And that risk mitigation does not have to come at the cost of toil and time and delay and you know, developers having to stop their flow and filing a ticket to ask a question from a compliance perspective or from a cultural perspective. So we started looking at how do we reduce toil? Um, how do we automate you know, some of the low risk, uh, low uh, judgment you know, items into the system, into tooling, into workflow? So we don't have to have developers stop and file a ticket, can I consume this? Or stop and file a ticket, you know, uh, can I contribute this? Or uh, can I release this code, et cetera? So make it easy for them to do the simple things. And, and tooling is what a lot of OSPOs do also because there is no bespoke you know, open source tooling today. For every language, for every company's custom workflow, you need different tooling. So we end up doing a lot of tooling and a lot of process and mechanisms so that uh, the toil on developers to stop and, and ask and stop and consume is, uh, is lowered. Because, I mean, modern software development is about using open source. It's about engaging. It's about contributing. And if you make each of these steps heavy and 
um, you know, toil uh, laden or difficult or causing delay, uh, you really have a very poor uh, developer experience. The other thing we started working on is empowering developers to more early in the development process, asking questions and having tools such that they can discover the level of risk or the level of issues in open source they face so that they can solve those questions early, they can file a ticket early, consult us early, and uh, solve those problems early in the development lifecycle rather than wait until a product is released or they're a week away from something. And education in playbooks is something uh, that's so important from uh, a developer perspective as to why we want them to do something, when they should come to us, when they should uh, you know, resolve this issue themselves. Um, I think it saves hundreds and hundreds of hours of people's time uh, to wait. Uh, and, and most OSPOs, by the way, are usually small, small groups of people, right? They're usually, I think uh, the OSPO survey says most are between five and 10 uh, people on average. And we are about 15 of us. Um, but it's still, if you're serving thousands and thousands and thousands of developers in a company, uh, you don't scale. So all of these steps really help us empower developers and, and to scale uh, compliance and education and process across the company. The um, self-service piece has become more and more important for us also. And then I think a lot of companies do this uh, at Comcast. Uh, when Brittany and I worked together, we, we had champions um, and ambassadors across the company because we can't afford to do uh, everything ourselves. And we want to elevate the knowledge level in each business unit, in each organization of people who know what open source is and can advocate in their business unit and, and work to reduce the toil for that business unit. And, and by the way, they also have really detailed knowledge of how their business uses open source. So they bring that contextual knowledge, high context, high judgment, uh, to doing the work. And so uh, we've been really investing in champions and Diego is part of that program. And we have, I think about 200 champions now, and we hope to get to a thousand. So because we have like 90,000 plus developers across the company, so you can't scale with, you know, what we have. So those uh, are some of the things I think OSPOs are doing today, uh, not just mitigating risk, but balancing risk and developer experience uh, as a whole so that developers can do their best work and have high impact. And security is the other area I think that we've all been getting involved in. Uh, I, can, I, can you show me your hand, if, uh, raise your hand if you are uh, actively working with your security teams in your company? Exactly, exactly. We've become best friends with security and um, I think OSPOs have to be the cultural guide to open source. Um, security is an expert at what they do, but navigating open source security is a different game altogether. You know, you have thousands of producers of open source, uh, vulnerabilities are disclosed differently, uh, how you patch it is different, and how you navigate and work with this is different. So. Uh, becoming uh, a best friend to security and working with them uh, and tooling is, is extremely important. So I think everything from working uh, with, with your company and educating them on why they need to support upstream projects, why they need to support things like OpenSSF is, is advocacy work we do. The second thing is um, not just screening for license, but screening for security, screening for community health, um, and again, really bringing that knowledge to the tooling organization and making sure we're screening a broader set of things. And tracking has become such an important element, right? I mean, if, if Log4j is used in, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000 uh, places across your company, knowing where it's used and how it's used uh, is extremely vital information when you are uh, given that order to patch all of those uh, servers or all of those applications. 
And it's also important from uh, a Biden directive and from an SBOM uh, perspective. Uh, but it's good hygiene to, to know where you're using your open source uh, dependencies. And then keeping your software updated and fresh and then patched. I think uh, uh, the survey from Synopsys uh, said that a lot of times a patch is available. The vulnerability is known, a patch is available, but the consumer has not bothered patching. And that has caused uh, you know, exploits like Heartbleed, et cetera. So keeping on top of uh, patching is, is something that's so important. And then security and OSPO partnership. We, uh, in our OSPO, have increasingly been working with uh, our security brothers and sisters and making sure that we understand their perspective um, when we manage tools like GitHub and manage tools uh, across the company, but also provide them with uh, knowledge of how open source works and what to look for and how to engage with uh, communities, etc. Who has heard of ChatGPT lately? <laughs> Who hasn't heard of ChatGPT lately? So it's, I mean, AI has been around for quite a while and machine learning has been around for quite a while, but all of a sudden it's front and center. And it's, it's front and center for us. Um, we get questions on use. Can I use it uh, as a service to generate code or do something? Uh, where can I use it? Um, and how do I get the source? You know, what was the model trained on? What's the license for that source? Who, who owns the copyright for that source? And so we are having to guide developers on safe use and create, you know, our legal team has been working uh, to create a policy around this. When can you use it? When can you not use it? How can you use it? Uh, and things of that nature. So OSPOs are smack in the middle of all this because it seems like a logical place to come to. If you're going to this organization for license use, I wanna ask them about uh, data sets. Can I use this public data set? Can I use this model? Can I use this service? And so we've been getting into that. Um, we are also clearly getting into compliance and due diligence, right? Uh, what should we look for uh, to allow people to use a data set? What should we uh, look for uh, from model perspective? You know, what's okay, what's not okay? Um, thankfully, we have some really educated uh, legal teams that we are working with who have been helping us um, do the due diligence, but, but we need to standardize these processes because the tsunami is coming. <laughs> the questions are going to you know, escalate and, and we need to have you know, standard operating procedures in place for all these questions when they come in. And lastly, how should we participate in, open, in uh, AI? Uh, you know, should we contribute uh, data sets? Should we uh, contribute models? Should we release them? Uh, you know, how, what license should we use? Uh, what construct should we use? Uh, so all of these questions, they're emerging fast and furiously, and OSPOs need to start getting ahead of uh, these uh, considerations. And participation also includes policy, education, you know, participating in policy, uh, because there are a lot of regulations coming at us uh, from Europe, from US, and we need to understand what that means and whether we need to advocate for you know, developers in our organization and developers in open source and make sure that their freedoms are uh, continued. Um, this, is an, this is one that's been around for a while and will continue uh, and is continuing more and more. To me, you know, with the macroeconomic climate especially and uh, shifting investment levels in companies, um, I always think about, am I articulating the value of what we do inside the company? Am I making an impact? Is my team and I making a business impact? Are we helping the company? Uh, are we understanding what the mission and uh, you know, business objective of our organization is? And are we tying our work to that? Because you don't want to become irre irrelevant. You don't want to become just a cost center. 
and it's easy for OSPOs to be looked at as a cost center, right? And, and the first place to maybe eliminate or change. Um, and so the chaos group does a lot of good work on metrics, but to me, it's, it's articulating what business impact are we making by different businesses? How are we helping with cost reduction, toil reduction, time to market, enabling uh, new partnerships in the company? You know, helping uh, teams in the company navigate foundations, become members of different projects. Uh, how is it helping our brand from a reputation perspective, from uh, an innovation perspective? So measuring and communicating this regularly is, is such a critical part of the OSPO job. It's very easy to get buried in the work that we're doing and not to do this. Um, in, in our case, we have uh, business reviews every quarter, so we constantly work to refine what we are communicating in those business reviews and how we are demonstrating impact uh, in the company. I, I wanted to kind of end with a little bit about the Amazon OSPO because I said it's important to understand the business context in which you live uh, and what you serve and what are the objectives and outcomes that the company cares about and shape the OSPO and the open source organizations in your company uh, to serve that. So in our case, uh, there really are three reasons why we invest in open source as a company. One is we build on open source extensively. Across the company, we use a ton of open source. Uh, I think some of the surveys say companies use between 70 and 90% of their stack is open source. I dare say we, we are in that average. Uh, whether it's devices or AWS, we, we absolutely, our builders, our developers love open source and build with open source. And customers, especially on the AWS side, want us to be a good platform for open source development and to support open source projects that they love. Um, on the device side, which is consumers, they care less about what we build on, but they care about innovation, they care about great uh, experiences and time to market. So uh, customers do indeed choose open source. And the last piece has become more and more important to us, which is that the world, uh, the digitization of the world depends upon open source and uh, we have to sustain it. We have to make sure that uh, it's healthy and that code is healthy, communities are healthy. And so these are the three pillars that guide us uh, in terms of why we do open source. Just very quickly on the build on open source side, since the early days, open source has been you know, core to what we do. Um, and it's how modern development works. So we, we support our builders, uh, our developers, and uh, we support the use of open source across the company. Customers, I talked about the fact that you know on AWS and the other side, they use open source. And frankly, our partners on the devices side, whether it's a, a semiconductor partner or an ODM, want to collaborate with us. And open source is a great way to collaborate across that uh, chain. And you know, the cloud, if it's your computing platform of choice, you want it to be easy to use open source. And the last one, we actually have a new leadership principle called, uh, uh, you know, with success and scale comes great responsibility and we want to leave the world a better place. And so we do want to be a good citizen. Uh, and sustaining open source is critical to us, both selfishly as well as uh, because the world depends upon it. And so we are on a continuous journey to be a good citizen uh, of open source. The to-do group survey, I believe, is, is the 2022 is available and the new one is coming up and Anna will probably share that in her talk. Um, other resources, there's a deep dive into open source program offices on the Linux Foundation website. And selfishly, I want to plug the book, uh, Open Source Law, Policy and Practice, which Amanda Brock um, edited and I contributed chapter 19, which is on OSPOs. And I think it's a great reference book. Uh, we are doing book signing at 5.30 tonight uh, in the expo hall. 
And if you want to do more deep diving, uh, there's a security panel later this afternoon um, in, in room 211 that will go more into open source security. So if you want to deep dive into that, uh, the book signing I talked about, and then uh, ask the expert tomorrow if, if you want to talk more about what we are doing or want to ask me a question, uh, that's a great place to be. Um, and that's the talk. Um, I think we have, uh, how many minutes do we have for questions? I would just keep going. That's oh. okay. So, uh, okay. I, I, that's, that's what I prepared. And uh, I think we should, we should open it up to questions and, and uh, have a discussion. Yes. I have my good friend Suzanne here who, who deeply works in that area, so I, I will call upon her to comment as well. And Suzanne, this is a, so uh, the question was, how are you demonstrating positive brand impact, um, you know, and uh, I guess perception surveys. So what the, um, we have a marketing team which lives in uh, open source marketing and strategy which lives in the marketing side. So they've been running surveys uh, every year about uh, perception of customers of our work in open source, how important is open source to uh, choosing uh, AWS as a platform, um, what kinds of things do they want to see us do. And, and we've been using that as one of our uh, sentiment uh, analysis and brand impact surveys. Um, the OSPO survey, the to-do group survey is a good one because it really shows uh, how developers are perceiving uh, different companies from their open source brand. Um, I look at that and see, you know, are we improving year over year? Are people seeing us more favorably than before? Um, you know, the soft aspects of coming to a conference, uh, people saying, hey, I really like what you guys are doing. I, you seem to be, you know, improving. Clearly, articles, uh, you know, written about your work uh, is, is good stuff. But let me ask Suzanne to also comment. Suzanne, by the way, leads open source marketing for VMware, and she's been really focused on this area. Um, just trying to project. Um, yeah. I am not in the open source program office, and I never have been. I've always been in our global marketing or working alongside our open source program office. And open source is an important part of VMware's overall brand. So we do measure it in a variety of ways. We measure uh, customers' perception of our brand every quarter in a net promoter score survey, an NPS survey that goes directly to our customers. We also measure perception change in more industry types of surveys in a brand tracker where we ask that specific question, you know, what do you think of VMware and open source? Is it important to your buying criteria? And then we also benchmark that data against the survey that Nithya mentioned, which is coming from the to-do group, which asks a, a similar version of that question. So we start to triangulate where it lands in customers' eye lines, if you will. And what I have observed in the last six years it started as a sort of huh from customers to today where it's like, yeah, I know I expect you to be there, VMware. That is a given that you will be there and you will be a leader. And it's an important part of our overall personality in the market. And the open source program office helps to guide a lot of that activity. When I started with the open source program office, I approached it from uh, a perspective, marketing and strategy that I call do, be, do, be, do. Hmm. Which is go do it, go be it. Then go do it and go be it. Go do it and go be it. And after you've done that, then I'll start telling the story about it. Yes. Because marketing likes to tell the story in advance of the delivery. And I flip that on its head. I said, no, you go be and do. And then I'll come back and talk to you at the first program office about the stories to be told. 
So if you have any other questions, you can find the answer. I, kind of adding on to that, I'm curious too, so like that's a beautiful story that how you're able to externally share open source and the mission, Amazon and this, that, you know, that's amazing externally. What about internal shareholders, right? The people that are signing your budget. So how can we share, there's many different ways that we can leverage and quantify these metrics to share with our stakeholders, but what is one particular underlying pattern that we could all leverage to kind of make sure like, hey, our office is relevant internally? That's a, that's a really, really good story. And in fact, it's even more important uh, to, to make sure that not just developers, but uh, middle managers and the executives are seeing that this is very crucial to innovation and you know, development in the company. Um, one of the constructs we are using is a business review. Uh, every single um, organization in Amazon goes through a business review every quarter, month, weekly. Uh, we are just doing a quarterly review. And the first page is metrics of, um, in, because we live in builder experience, we try to aim at how we're reducing toil, how we're reducing delay, how we're reducing paper cuts for our developers, how we're speeding time to innovation. So it's been more um, making developer experience uh, really good versus revenue or cost, because revenue and cost is so, so darn difficult to connect the dots to. Uh, you know, yeah, because of this upstreaming of this batch, you know, this resulted in this. So we are using quarterly business reviews a great deal. The second way is, uh, frankly, uh, there's an internal newsletter that the open source marketing team has developed, and it goes out every month. Uh, and I know we used to do that at Comcast, that is so important because people need to know what's happening and what kinds of things we're working on. Uh, third, we do launch announcements whenever we do, just like a product team, we do a formal launch announcement when we introduce a new program. So when Diego introduced the Champions program, we did a launch announcement and amplified it to all of leadership and uh, you know, on open source Slack channels, et cetera, so that people know that we are working on their behalf and we are introducing all these different things. Um, I, I welcome ideas from others in terms of how are you doing business impact uh, communications in your company? How are you making sure you are here, you're heard and your value is heard? Yes. Mm. Stepping in and solving some of these problems. And similarly, we had uh, engineers internally in the company just directly come to us and say, We're stuck on this, it hasn't been patched in, for, in forever. Can someone fix this? And then we would. And though it's not always easy to measure exactly the amount of hours saved on that, it was like the repercussions of that were huge. That's, that's a fantastic. <laughs> so the point made was. Uh, how much money we saved on support contracts because uh, you know we were able to access source code and fix it ourselves. I think Sheila probably can attest to that uh, at Comcast as well. We would we would say you know we are saving X amount of dollars by not buying proprietary software and instead buying you know a, an open source commercial open source. And then if you move further from commercial open source to actually supporting open source upstream directly yourself you're saving you know, much more money. So that was very tangible from a, a financial savings perspective. And then the ability to kind of patch things yourself and, and jump in and do things versus wait for a vendor or wait for someone else to fix things is, is quantifiable. Yes? What can open source projects and maintainers do to make your job easier, either showing value or at least so you're saying community maintainers, how can they make it easier for companies to engage? Right, or people in an OSPO to you know, make the, the pitch internally. Yeah, so, um, so the question is how can upstream maintainers make it easier for OSPOs to uh, show engagement or invest in engaging with those upstream projects, right? Did I get that right? Yes. Um, one of the uh, concerns I hear uh, from a lot of OSPOs is it's difficult to uh, upstream a patch because uh, you know I 
have to wait for the upstream team to kind of include it, I have to socialize it, I have to, it, the process is much longer, I have to build trust and, and sometimes the patch that I uh, submit doesn't get accepted, I don't get feedback. And, and I know the, the burden is put on the maintainer, but I think the more frictionless that process can be, uh, for companies to contribute or others to contribute to the process, that would be better. I think the onus is also on us to engage early and communicate and work with uh, maintainers to make sure that we are, uh, you know, uh, earning a seat at the table to contribute, right? Because you can't just come in and do a flyby contribution and, and leave. The other thing I would say is, um, to teach you know, people from companies who are engaging with your project to become advocates for the project inside the company uh, and support the project through whether it's GitHub sponsors or uh, to ask you, you know, what do you need as a maintainer and what should we do to support you would be uh, really helpful. We, we are uh, telling our teams who have strong dependencies upon open source projects to, to please spend the time to do, uh, you know, blocking and tackling for the project and maintenance work, not just, you know, be someone who uh, throws a contribution over the fence, but to actually be a part of the maintenance team and support the, the, the group and ask them what they need. Uh, because we depend upon it, but we also want to make sure that uh, these projects uh, get what they need and are supported by us. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. Hey. Sorry. I think any size company can have an OSPO. It does not have to be a, an entire person or a full team. It can be someone whose job it is to coordinate uh, the OSPO. Uh, Anna will also add to it. Uh, for example, Netflix, I think, has a volunteer, a set of volunteers across the company. They don't have a formal OSPO, and they kind of collectively work together on OSPO-like uh, functions. It could be someone in a startup who, whose job it is, who's enthusiastic about open source, whose job it is to, you know, advocate and become an expert at it, and I think Frankly, every startup should be thinking about open source hygiene, uh, open source IP, uh, and open source uh, you know, engagement with communities. Uh, yeah. But Jacob's going to say something, then we're going to go uh, there. We should talk more. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I'm in a very similar situation. I work at Starburst and I do a developer relations for the Tree Wars project. And I used to do all for the last orientation. And it's just multiple tasks, but it's very much related. And you just have to think of it like you have your one main open source project, the Cockroach or Tree Wars, and then 
you just start caring about all the other open source projects. And if you know about things like the security of your platform, you compliance and like tokenizing, those kind of things, you automatically get asked these questions. And I sort of like wear my sort of hat in that. But it's basically actually happening. You just don't have the official name as well. So yeah. it's just a gradual journey. But the task will always be there. And once you sell your software, someone is going to go, where is my dependency license compliance and stuff very quickly? And then you automatically doing all the work. And because you know from your open source project, you're going to be doing the possible work. It's just a label then. And you, and you can't help to bring, bring that label into the organization because it widens your scope of responsibility and, and communicates that to your leaders that, well, there's also the legality that we just want to trademark stuff and legal compliance stuff. So it helps you to potentially get other people into your team. One last piece I'll say is um, at SanDisk when we didn't have an OSPO, um, I wrote um, a one-page pitch uh, to our SVP of engineering saying why we need an OSPO. So that may be another thing to do and to do your research and say why it would benefit Cockroach uh, Labs uh, to, to have an OSPO and how it will help with brand perception but also with uh, developer experience and you know other aspects yeah yes um, one other aspect that uh, is often overlooked is having an OSPO and a strong open source presence how that reduces sales friction yes and don't forget about customers are choosing open source get cozy with your sales operations your sales people and find out how often customers ask about open source how often you present about it yes because having a strong positive uh, brand and open source does reduce sales friction. It makes the customer more comfortable and move faster. And yep. that is really important. In it's the, money. It's, it's the path to money. Exactly, exactly. So don't be embarrassed by that. That's right. I think we're running out of time, uh, sadly. I, can, I want to ask a question of all of you. What other topic should we include in things that OSPO should be thinking about in 2023 and beyond? What, what did I miss? You can shout it out. Yes. Possibly to open up, open up the organization itself. Like see a concept point for the open source project to be able to approach the Amazon and say, hey, my open source project is using Amazon. I know how to find the right people to talk to that use it so they can contribute. Yes, yes. We, we need to be the conduit into the company uh, for open source foundations, organizations, maintainers, etc., and then back out again, right? Be a guide to open source. Yes? I would love a workshop, training, boot camp, something like that. If you want to do, if you want to start up an open source programs office, here are the actual steps that you have to do. Here are the best practices. The to-do group has been documenting that religiously, and they do, uh, Anna will probably share that, uh, Emma, you, you had a question or comment. Oh, my question was just around the Champions program. So my dad and I worked on Microsoft Oslo. Um, we, all, we have a Champions group that has over 100 people. Um, and everyone who joins and participates is there because they care about open source, they're either an expert or a gift. But enabling them to be successful on the things that Microsoft needs is, is actually quite challenging. Like yes. Getting people to reach out to the Champions, um, you have like a search by skill set, but I'm just wondering how you, you know, maybe your strength experiment, how you're seeing that work, like seeing the champions be successful and I broadening that. I would connect with Diego um, Horquera uh, after the call talk um, because he's intimately involved in driving the champions program. In fact, yeah, in all of these details, it's not easy. A lot of heavy lifting. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and so, but there's a lot of benefit. So thank you so much uh, for being here and, and I hope this was useful and I, I welcome other suggestions for topics that we should include in this uh, discussion of what we should be doing in our 2023 and beyond. Thank you.